to Lakeshore Baptist Church on this, the third Sunday of Easter. As you can see from your bulletin, our Easter prayer calls for each of us to love the Lord and love the world. I can't help thinking that loving the world is what a welcoming and affirming church does 365 days a year. Isn't it wonderful to be part of a place that is built on love and acceptance in the worship of God? To this day, I am grateful to Carolyn Rodeba and Nancy Gelbach for introducing my family and me to this church almost 20 years ago. I have to admit that having been raised in the Catholic faith, joining a Baptist church had never been on my bucket list. We follow an ancient tradition here at Lakeshore that to me is all about loving the world. When we pass the peace to each other, we affirm our connection to each other and our love for this community. So I invite you now to unmute and respond to each other. May the peace of Christ be with you. And with you. And also, also with, with you. you. With you. And, and with Christ, Christ everybody. Christ, 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 Christ be with you. Take care and bro. Christ be with you. And Mary and Mary are Christ with you. well, oh, hey, you found the video. Hi, good to see you. Hey, Preston, you're out. Hey, good tidings, man. How you doing? As we continue with worship, uh, join us responsively while muted on Zoom, but out loud in your home. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Hear my prayer. The Lord has chosen everyone who is faithful to be God's own. And God answers our prayers. Tremble and do not sin. Search your hearts and be silent. Some ask, who will be good to us? Let your kindness, Lord, shine brightly on us. You brought us more happiness than a rich harvest of grain. I can lie down and sleep soundly because you, Lord, will keep me safe. Yes. Will you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, who comes among us when we are gathered together, even virtually, Bless us with your presence here this morning and hear our prayers. We pray for all those many who have suffered this year from loss and grief or illness or violence or any other issue that caused pain. Comfort them and help them to know that even in hard times, you were with them and love them. Help us to remember the needy and the poor during this time of pandemic and throughout the year. Help us to bring hope to those who are ill, oppressed, or in despair. Keep our nation and our world under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Have mercy on us and forgive us for our sins. Be with us now and throughout this day and this week. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Hear the words from the gospel, from the gospel of Luke. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of grace. Thanks be to God. Hi, everybody. This is Rev G, and most importantly, my new doggo, Rose. Today, we are outside Lakeshore Baptist Church in our Peace Garden. I wanted to bring us here as we sit and wonder what it means to be caregivers of the planet. In our holy scriptures, starting in the very beginning in Genesis, we're told that God created everything around us, the birds, the plants, our four-legged friends, and even ourselves, human beings. But there was a very important commandment that we received, a very important rule to follow, and it's that we are supposed to be caregivers to the planet. We're supposed to take care of those things that are around us, be they plants, animals, or even the ground that we walk on. And at Lakeshore, we have this peace garden as a place where we can come and sit with friends, family, or even by ourselves and pray and listen for God's voice. I like to sit out here whenever I am trying to see what I need to do to be able to help take care of the planet. We're surrounded by trees, this wonderful bridge to walk over, and all kinds of flowers all over the property. We even have some pretty flowers over there by the labyrinth. I want to invite you all to think this week about how you can help take care of the things that are around you. If you guys have a garden at your home or even some plants that you have where your mom and dads and grandparents and guardians like to make sure they're nice and beautiful. How can you help the planet? 
How can you follow God's call in our lives to continue to take care of the things that we are given? Join me in prayer. Our God, we're grateful for the ways that you take care of us through plants and animals and the earth underneath our feet. This week, I ask that we can take off our shoes and feel the dirt between our toes and know that you are here with us, calling us to be caregivers, calling us to follow your scripture, which tells us to continue to try to do good things for each other and the planet. Be with us this day. Amen. Bye, everybody. May we pray together. Risen Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for all the churches on this earth, for all the communities of faith throughout the globe that are working day by day, no matter their size or store of resources. They're working to bring signs of your abundant love, justice, and compassion to those within the realm of their care. In this season of following you, the risen Christ, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for the small part of your church in the world called Lakeshore Baptist Church. May we remember that like other congregations, we have our part to do in bringing your gospel to life through our commitment to Jesus Christ. This year, the world is consumed by troubles and her shoulders are bent with exhaustion. Show us your way, O oh God, and point us toward the things we can do to help. In this season of following you, the risen Christ, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, for those tasked in these days with guiding our church toward wholeness and health and your gospel. We pray for your wisdom and guidance to settle upon committees tasked with leading us toward new days of being your church in this time and place. Like you did for your disciples, open our minds to understand the scriptures and open our hearts more each day so that we are ready to receive more of your teachings. In this season of following you, the risen Christ, Lord in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for all those shaken this week by the news of family and friends who have needs, physical and mental, spiritual and emotional, needs that need tending. Hear our prayer for those who need healing and those of us who stand ready to help in whatever way we can. When we realize this pandemic has not gone away, Calm our fears, tend our hearts. Much we need your tender care. In this season of following you, the risen Christ, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, for the things we need help nurturing within ourselves. The gift of long listening and careful conversation the resilience to pray and act once more through the task before us, the capacity for imagination for a new future and the will to participate in it, willing spirits to echo your words, peace be with you, to your children we meet for the first time this week, to those with whom we work and create ideas, and to those closest to us. In this season of following you, the risen Christ, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And hear our prayers of thanksgiving, O oh Lord, for the new twin great-grandsons for the Rotobas, for encouraging encouragement in the healing of our family members and friends, for a cube of boxes for Twifu Human Ghana, on its way to the ship for Shalom, for the beauty of the blue bonnets and irises in our yards this spring, for the spontaneous acts 
of care that we see and receive, for we are witnesses to these things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers of thanksgiving. Hear all our prayers, for we ask them in your name, the risen Christ. Amen. God's people said. Uh, Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, before we get to the scripture, let me make a, a bit of a statement about what's ahead for us for the next few weeks. The period between the first Easter and the first Pentecost was one of the most critical in the history of the church. It was also a period of uncertainty and confusion. When Jesus was executed, the leaders of what was left of his band of followers were faced with some practical issues. What did we do? Where did we go? And there were also some major theological questions. Who are we in relation to other Jews? Who are we in relation to people who aren't Jews? We're going to consider these questions and ramifications of the church's answers in the weeks ahead beginning today with a question that runs throughout the entire New Testament. How is Christianity related to Judaism? Or more personally, how are Christians related to Jews? Our epistle reading is from the book of Acts, the third chapter, verses 11 through 16. While the man clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one, and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we were witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Christ Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Benji moved into our neighborhood when I was in high school. 
Ours was a working class, middle class, mostly Protestant neighborhood, except for the Catholic Grunwalds who lived across the road. I was related to them in some complicated way that I never quite understood. The boys in the neighborhood were interested in cars, sports, and girls, not necessarily in that order. We played tackle football in our side yard every Sunday afternoon. Benji was not one of the guys. He wore thick glasses. He hiked his pants high. He sat ramrod straight on the school bus and walked that way too. He was from somewhere else, somewhere up north, we thought. I never got to know Benji well. All I knew was that he was going to hell, which was too bad because in spite of what I just said, he seemed like a good guy. Benji, uh, Benjamin Hablitzel, was a Jew, and Jews rejected Jesus. They didn't just reject him, they killed him. So they deserved to spend eternity in hell. They and all their descendants from now until forever. That's what I was taught in the Southern Baptist Church I grew up in. And I guess that's what I believed, though even then I must have wondered what God had against Benji. Walter Harrelson, who was dean of the Vanderbilt Divinity School at the time, 1999, and Rabbi Randolph Falk, uh, Falk co-authored a book titled Jews and Christians. The subtitle, A Troubled Family. Troubled family indeed, with a complicated, mostly depressing history. It has been so since the beginning, the very beginning in the New Testament church. The tensions are present in the passage from the book of Acts that we just read. Peter and John had come to the temple in Jerusalem at three o'clock in the afternoon, which the author tells us was the time for prayer. That little detail is significant because it reminds us that Peter and John were Jews. They'd come to the temple to pray. Indeed, the last paragraph of the preceding chapter in the book of Acts says that the small band of believers worshipped in the temple every day because they were Jews. Peter and John were interrupted by a lame man who was brought to the temple every day by friends so he could beg passers-by for money. He asked Peter for money, and Peter replied famously, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Christ Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. As you can see, Peter spoke impeccable King James English. Peter took the man by the hand, and the man got up and walked. And then he ran and jumped and danced and praised God and caused such a commotion that Peter felt it necessary to explain what had just happened. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our our ancestors, Peter said, letting the people know that he too was a Jew. The God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus. This is a Jew talking to Jews about the one he believes is the Jewish Messiah. Then he said, but you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life. In 1965, the Second Vatican Council rejected the idea that Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, which had been standard Christian teaching for centuries and a prime justification for persecuting Jews. So where did the idea come from? Well, we just read it. You killed the author of life. You, you Jews. You killed the holy and righteous one. Peter had said much the same thing in his sermon on Pentecost, which according to the book of Acts was the very first Christian sermon. To a crowd of Jews who were in town for the Feast of Weeks, Peter said, this man, Jesus, handed over to you by Judas, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. A few chapters later in the book of Acts, Stephen says to a crowd, which will become his executioners, 
which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you have become his betrayers and his murderers. Matthew's gospel has the crowd yell to Pilate, his blood be on us and on our children, which was cited centuries later as justification for continued violence against Jews. I mean, after all, they asked for it, right? Incidentally, that line was so offensive that Mel Gibson was forced to take it out of his movie, The Passion of Christ. Too offensive for a Mel Gibson movie, but not so for some Christian churches during Holy Week. But in spite, of, in spite of all of these scriptures and what they clearly said, Vatican II argued and argued reasonably, what happened to Christ in his passion cannot be attributed to the whole people then alive, much less to those of today. And it makes sense. What Vatican II did not do was place the responsibility for the death of Jesus where it obviously belongs. Jesus was convicted in a Roman trial that was conducted by a Roman governor. And according to Roman law, he was executed on a Roman cross and guarded by Roman citizens. But as far as I know, there has never been a serious effort to hold all Italians responsible for the death of Jesus. If you quote me on that, please note that I was being sardonic. We have to face the fact that statements in the New Testament claiming that Jews were responsible for Jesus' death have had tragic consequences throughout history. It's not a huge step from Stephen saying that Jews murdered Jesus to Christians hundreds of years later saying that Jews were Christ killers. And we don't have to go back that far. John Ernest, the 19-year-old man who shot and killed one and wounded three in a synagogue in Southern California in 2019, said he did it in part because the Jews killed Jesus. And he said he wanted to kill Jews. A statement that stunned his church-going family, as well as his pastor. His pastor said, we can't pretend as though we didn't have some responsibility for him. He was radicalized into white nationalism from within the very midst of our church. What responsibility did his church have? What responsibilities do churches have? What responsibilities do we have? Many, I think, beginning with thinking clearly and honestly about our own history and grappling with our own scriptures. Did those passages I cited, the ones that claim that Jews killed Jesus, did they surprise you? Had you ever heard them before? I think a Bible study of Jewish-Christian relations in the New Testament might be a good place to start. And, and if you do, um, a good companion guide might be the Jewish and annotated New Testament. It's the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, but the footnotes and 200 pages of appendices were all written by Jewish scholars. Among our other responsibilities, to teach our children respect for one of history's great religions, to give them more factual information than many of us were given. Of course, that assumes that we have factual information to teach them. To find ways to work cooperative with, cooperatively with synagogues and temples, especially in areas of peace and justice, areas in which Jews and Christians have, at least for recent decades, locked arms and walked together. There's an iconic photograph of Martin Luther King Jr. on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. To his left, their arms locked at the elbow, is Reverend Ralph Abernathy. To his right, their arms also locked, is Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, one of great Jewish religious thinkers of the 20th century. In the year 2000, 170 religious leaders and Jewish scholars published a document titled, in English, Speak the Truth. The statement said, Jews and Christians, each in their own way, recognize the unredeemed state of the world as reflected in the persistence of persecution, poverty, human degradation, and misery. 
Although justice and peace are finally God's, our joint efforts, together with those of other faith communities, will help bring the kingdom of God for which we long and for which we hope. Our responsibilities, I think, also include digging deeper into the richness of the Hebrew Bible and to find a way to see Jesus through different eyes, through Jewish eyes. And since I'm into recommending books, I recommend anything by Amy Jill Levine, Jewish New Testament scholar at Vanderbilt Divinity School, especially her books on the parable, which she calls the short stories of Jesus, and the book on Sermon on the Mount. And finally, I think we have the responsibility to speak up, stand up and show up against anti-Semitism, which seems to survive through the centuries like some ancient eradicable pestilence. The Anti-Defamation League began tracking anti-Semitic hate crimes four decades ago. According to the ADL, 2020 witnessed the third highest number of anti-Semitic acts in 40 years. In the study by the American Jewish Committee, 35% of American Jews said they experienced anti-Semitism in the past, past five years. After Charlottesville, where demonstrators marched around Congregation Beth Israel, carrying flags, bearing swastikas and other Nazi symbols, and shouting Sieg Heil. After Charlottesville, threats were made against Temple Emmanuel in Winston-Salem, where we live. And so a call went out for friends, non-Jews, to come to the temple on Friday evening and stand on the sidewalk as a buffer between congregants coming to the Shabbat service and whoever might drive by with whatever malevolent intentions. Nikki and I joined a couple dozen people, welcoming friends of the temple and waiting, anxiously, I must say, for potential violence. It fortunately did not come. Later, I was asked what I would have done if people drove by throwing rocks. And I said, got hit probably. I'm not as quick on my feet as I used to be. But standing on the sidewalk, not knowing what was going to happen, but knowing why we were there, why we needed to be there, it all seemed very real and very frightening. A reality our Jewish friends live with all the time at some level. A friend who's a prominent member of the local Jewish community told Nikki recently that he had done something he never thought he would do. He bought a gun in case he needed to defend himself and his family. A troubled family? Historically, yes. But there are plenty of signs that the broken places are being healed. Churches like Lakeshore are being compelled by circumstances, conviction, and conscience to educate themselves and their children, to reach out in service with synagogues and temples, to speak up, to stand up, and to show up against anti-Semitism. There's a phrase you hear when Jews talk about their understanding of Judaism's mission, to come olam, to repair the world. It's a good thing, way to think about our task as well. Perhaps we can do it together. And now may the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Eli Wiesel and Abraham Joshua Hessel, the God of Jesus, the God of Fanny Lou Hamer, the God of Bishop Tutu, the God of Mother Teresa, be with you this day and all days. Amen. We will practice resurrection in the name of Christ our Lord, raising joyful alleluias in each kindness, deed, and word, living in faith the daily habit, helping your grace and hope unfold. This our Easter prayer and purpose, love the Lord and love the world.